So very interesting is that when I was doing a lot of the stuff that uh, Sam was talking about, the O2 platform and stuff like that, I felt I was doing some great research. I was, I was, I was doing some really cool stuff. And I, and I had this thing where everybody was very excited about it. And then they would go, now what? Now how do I use it? Now how do I actually implement this? And I kind of found that a lot of my research was very interesting. And I, I was doing stuff then, especially with static code analysis, right? I don't think people can still do today, right? And, I, and it's all open source. You guys can, can do all that stuff. But I kind of realized at the time that I actually needed to build a team and I needed to almost work you know, that kind of ideas within the business. And kind of what I've done is very similar to it. In fact, I actually think some of the stuff I was doing in O2 is even cr crazier than the stuff um, I'm going to show you now. But this has an advantage that this makes business sense, right? This actually is usable, right? And actually, this adds a lot of value. So um, first of all, I want to start by the end, because I know you're going to have a question, which is, how do I learn more about this? And how can I give, try the stuff I'm going to show you? So first of all, I've done some presentations. I've written a bunch of books. I highly recommend you guys to read this book. And it's not just I wrote this, but it's not just for Generation Z developers. You can get it for free on LeanPub. You can also download it on GitHub. All the, code, all, all the content is released in Creative Commons. But a lot of the ways, I think, is on this book. I just call it Generation Z developers because it helps me to have a target audience. And I quite like that generation. But again, a lot of the stuff that I talk and how I think is in here. In fact, some of, the, some of the people I work with, they say they read that book and understand better, actually, <laughs> while we're doing some stuff. So the other one is the Open Security Summit, which is also supported and worked with OWASP. So this is happening in June. It's basically a place where, um, can you put that here? Sorry. Is it possible to put the? Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, imagine a place where some of the best kind of minds and security come together, where we're actually solving on, you know, working on real problems, where we basically have security experts, developers, government agencies, vendors, uh, you know, executives, everybody kind of working together. And it basically is the environment for maximum geek time and collaboration. So we all talk about that we want to work together, we want to collaborate. Well, the summit is exactly that, right? And you can come for a day, you can come for a week. Basically, this is the people that came in last time. It's literally a great environment to learn and collaborate. And most of the stuff that I'm going to show you here, we have a whole track there. We're doing all the stuff. You know, my whole team is coming. So, and there's also teams from other companies. So it's a really great place to be. And here's some photos. And when I, and I, when you see the schema that we have, this is what our schema looked like last year. Actually, I think it's probably even worse now. But now it's usable. <laughs> um, this is the kind of tracks we have: security, maps and graphs, some DevSecOps, machine learning. We actually have Simon Wardley and David. Snowden uh, coming along. If you don't know them, there's two spectacular persons. We also have a lunch number of people from Threat Modeling and, and uh, open the, the SAM project and other things. So as I think Simon just confirmed, I think. So we're going to have a Zap track. So again, it's a place that is still the best place for OWASP projects. So the, it's the highest concentration of OWASP leaders by square mile that you can find. And they're all there to help. They're all there to work together. It's literally, you should bring your whole team. Like, that's what for we are doing. Like, literally, it's, it's our offside, and a whole my team, except somebody can't make it, is actually going to be there. So, we're creating a graph based secure organization. And just to kind of prefix this, graphs is nodes and edges, right? It's, everything connects to everything. So, in Photobox, our mission is to secure our customers' magic moments. And I think this is very important because it gives us a very strong north. So, it gives us a great motivation to what we do and allows us to align you know, a lot of the stuff that we do with this idea that we have to protect our customers' data. We have nine petabytes of photos. That's a lot of photos. We do a lot of stuff in AWS. Um, we have a lot of moving parts. And we actually all go the way from the website to factories, which is really cool, right? Because, you know, you have, get to protect websites and production PCL, you know, PCL systems. So I just like to drop a couple kind of meta levels objectives, because I like to think that you kind of have to have some sort of big kind of paths and themes. So one of them is that um, we really want to make sure that um, we want to basically allow the business to execute its mission and objectives with their accepted risk level. So this is the name of the game. It's always about risk. It's allowing that uh, whatever the business risk appetite is, is well understood and is well aligned. So I view that our job in security is to maximize that maximize that understanding so that the business can make fact-based risk decisions. And that's fundamental. And most organizations can't do that. And, and the reason, very simply, is because you can't connect facts and decisions and hypotheses and real stuff with all the way to what's happening at decision level. 
right? And what we've done was exactly that. So when you see our graphs I'm going to show you, what you need to think about it is we use them to allow the business to understand the real implications of what's going on and allow us to have a level of granularity and confidence that um, is very important. And it's no kind of, I think, coincidence that I started a lot of my crazy research doing static analysis. Because I view that I'm still doing static analysis, I'm just, I just have higher levels of abstractions. So I still have source to sync vulnerabilities, except now the source might be a person and the sync might be you know, a risk or vulnerability or the other way around, or it might be an exec, it might be something behavior, it might be an attacker, et cetera. But it's still the same concepts, right? Um, I think it's, it's very important that we allow the business to deploy changes because we are an agent of change. Every Thing you do in security is about asking the business to change stuff. And what we think is very easy is very hard because it's very hard to make changes in, you know, in, in a lot of environments. So we want to make sure the business can move faster. We want to make sure the business understands better how it behaves and what the side effects. So what I realized is that security plays a very absolutely fundamental uh, piece, so a, a player in the, in the company, right? So what I mean is that we are the only organization that has access to everybody. We're the only organization that has access to everything. We can talk to anybody all the way from the CEO to every part of the company. We actually think that we have a duty to explain that and, and expose that to the business because we are the only ones that can actually connect the data. And when you start adding all the data that we can consume and you can visualize it and you can add metadata, it's a very powerful thing. So we should be agents of visibility to the business. And I think that's very powerful. Um, we should, of course, increase the cost of malicious entity. After all, in most cases, there's some exceptions, but in most cases, this is an economic game, right? So it's all about making the business model of your attackers not work, make it expensive for them not to, be, to, to exploit you, right? And then we want to make sure that we effectively handle incidents and preventing crisis. So the way I set up the security incident team at Photobox Group is it almost like a SWAT team. So I have a pretty good, actually amazing team that goes from you know, exec leadership to technicians. When we have what we call a SEV1, everybody participates in an incident. And we do it not because we throw resources, because we do it because we view an incident as an opportunity. Incidents are opportunities to do a huge amount of transformation in short periods of time, and I guarantee you there's a huge amount of focus in that period to drive your changes. So we set up our team exactly like that. So it, and it's crazy effective. And then we want to make compliance easy because fundamentally that is the outcome of when you, when you, come out, when you connect everything and you understand what's happening. And that also helps a lot with the valuation of your company because it means you have a great story when you communicate with this. And I view that we enable the business to think in graphs, which, which is kind of a bit. So security is a major agent of change because every two we do request changes. Security is at the epicenter of data, so we can get data from everywhere. But data is not linear or tabular, right? Data is hyperlinked and relational, which is why you need graphs, nodes and edges, because in fact, that's how even most people think and communicate. So we need to manage and visualize data as a graph. So in a way, we're creating a graph-based secure organization. And in fact, I would argue that every organization is a graph, but I think if you focus on the security element because you control that, eventually you kind of influence and you, you reach out the rest of the business. So how do we do this? We started with a risk workflow. And uh, some here might actually remember, right, the first versions of this, right, which I did, you know, come with the projects. And, um, and then basically we kind of started to refactor this. We kind of went to something a bit more simple. But the key of this, which is funny because it's still today, the fundamental... I would say um, foundation of the whole thinking is this idea that every risk that you have, you either fix or you accept, right? And that means that we make everything on the record. In fact, I want to make a shirt that says, it's not personal, we just have a lot of attention to detail, right? Because we go to crazy levels of detail. We are some, I was explaining to somebody, he's saying, what we do is micro-ticketing. Because what we do is we chain risks and risks and risks and vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities and facts. And actually, even recently, we now have an explosion of risk types. We actually have questions and hypotheses and best practices and how-tos. Every one of these is, an, is, a, is an, a separate issue type that delivers something that is linked to everything. And that allows us to have a really amount of understanding 
of what we do. But everything is underpinning by the fact that somebody's going to have to click or say yes, or in Slack, you know, add a little emoji that says, I accept this fact. I accept this vulnerability. Because I guarantee you, until somebody has to click on it, they don't read it. Like, you can have a fully intelligent thread with somebody. They actually make valid comments, right? And then eventually, a month down the line, you make them commit and you realize they never paid attention. Because up until then, it didn't make a difference. Like, decisions, sorry, companies make decisions all the time. You see them in meetings. You propose something, somebody goes, mm, I'm not sure about this, I'm not convinced. That was a decision, right? That, in that moment in time, that person told the other person that I don't think you should go on that path. Maybe this part is more interesting, or I'm not comfortable, or I don't want to know about that path. So in security, it's very easy when you bring the big remote code execution or the crazy vulnerability. That's super easy, right? It's the other 99% of things and all the little middle bits, especially the middle ones who can combine to create a big problem, that's the problem. When you make people go on the record and managers and technical owners, and by the way, we have business owners, technical owners, and management owners, so we map the whole org, it becomes much harder. And, it, and you know what's even better? of all this, it actually makes the security people, uh, us, accountable. We are the worst one. We make crazy statements that uh, we don't encrypt stuff. It's like, really? We don't encrypt all of that particular thing? And then you go, no, 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 actually, we, we don't do this and we don't do that. So then you find that there's a level of granularity which is matched on reality. So this is also great to make us accountable because there's nothing like you going present something to a particular of engineers and business and then tear it to shreds because your data is wrong or because it didn't make sense. But the point is you learn and you go back and you evolve and you can, it gets better. So we use Jira as a graph database. Now this is a very important concept, right? So Jira is great at a lot of things. It's bad at a lot of other stuff, right? My pet kind of peeve with, with Jira is when you go and you have a problem and you Google and you find a dude in 2002 saying, hey, I would like to do this. Then there's this comedy of comments, which is like, hey, it's 2007, any ideas? Then some more stuff, then what the F is 2015? And then the guy goes, I give up, right? Basically, and I get it, right? Jira is super complex, right, et cetera. But Jira is not good at data visualization, Right? It's not good at data linking, it's not good at reporting, it's not good at a lot of things. But it's good at one thing, or is, is a great graph database. Right? And I've played with a lot, right? and I can tell you at the moment, Jira is one of the best. Although Jira, you know, the stuff that we do is not the bottleneck. Like, I don't have scalability problems with Jira, it's fine. But Jira has a really cool property. Now, as a graph database, and, and graph I mean nodes and edges, right? This connects to that, right? So you need to think that every issue in Jira is a node, right? So it, you have nodes for everything. So we have nodes for people, we have nodes for business entities, we have nodes for risks and vulnerabilities and tasks and facts and hypotheses and business assets and threat models and you can continue. Like if, if I probably challenge to find something in the business that we don't have a ticket for now, right? Because we just kept evolving. It also has an ID, which is very powerful. It has name value pairs, right? Which is basically the extra attributes that you can do. It has labels, which we actually don't use anymore, because labels are just another way to create a, a link. So we don't need that anymore. It has workflows, very powerful, right? So we create all sorts of crazy workflows, which is very powerful because it allows us to have state. It has assignees, it has timestamps, it has stuff. More importantly, it has links. And it has a name linked. So this is one of the reasons why I cannot do this in GitHub today, at least level, because they don't, GitHub does not have named links. And the reason why you need named links is you need to tell a story. And this is very powerful. And you'll see in a bit, now we now create a project. A project fixes vulnerabilities, delivers key results, right? It uh, uses particular services, affects certain systems. Each one of these is a link type and an issue type. So then you can tell a story and you can connect everything. So that's very powerful. But Jira doesn't scale, right? So what we do is we, is we basically build this. So we take Jira, we have a sync workflow that dumps it to Elasticsearch, right? So every couple of seconds. So basically you got to the point where you edit in Jira and by the time you get to Elasticsearch or our GS bot, it's updated. So it's close to real time. And then we have a bunch of Lambda functions who give us a Slack environment so we can talk. And this, is, this was a golden combination, because this provided a user interface to access our data, which is super fast, and, is, and, and made Jira a place to edit. And actually, that's really good. Jira, as an edit, especially when you clean up the links, works really, really well. So 
We have data in Slack, so in Elasticsearch, which is really cool, lots of dashboards, lots of stuff we do. And then we have a bot, right? So we basically create a serverless, actually, I'm not sure the other one's serverless. So it's all serverless. Everything I showed you scales. In fact, there's a whole bunch of problems we're finding in Lambda, which is really interesting, right? Including some interesting, I would probably even call vulnerabilities on that thing, right? I guess the biggest one, if anybody think AWS Lambda here, probably you guys doing, right? The, the freaking containers are not unique, right? Now, that is crazy. I thought from a security point of view that, hey, every container is unique. At least some stuff happening in one. It doesn't happen in the other one. No, right? Which causes a huge amount of problems when you use them a lot of stuff. But it's still amazing, right? I think AWS is kicking out of the park, right? We use all sorts of AWS features, right? It's still, one, I think, one of the best clouds. I know the other ones are actually Azure is doing some good stuff, and Google is doing some amazing stuff too, right? But so we have a bot. We have piles of commands that you can issue. We can do all sorts of stuff from, from Jira to graphs to you know, uh, expand things and also manipulate. So this is quite interesting because we actually can manipulate. So we can create a graph of a search, then manipulate it, add stuff, remove stuff. So it becomes very, very interactive. So it's super powerful. So let me show you now some of the stuff that my team has been creating it. Because I think the big difference is that this is all good if I was the one using it. So this, was not, sorry, this wouldn't be that useful if I was the only one that could use this. Right? For me, the real power is when, and Maeve is going to join me in a second, and Maeve is one of my rock stars, right? That she's doing spectacular work, right? And, uh, and Sonia actually here, she's going to join the team, right? Very, very quickly, very soon, in about uh, less than a month. And they, they are the ones that are actually using this, right? And that makes sense. That's the power of it. So I, I just quick, I can search for it. I can do plant UML stuff, so you can see. I can do some interesting things. And this is where it becomes interesting, where you start to connect each of the issue with the other one. So you could see that we have a project that reduces the risk of that, that creates that, that reduces that. Right? So this is when you start to hyperlink projects all the way to our top level risk themes that we report to top level management. And this is actually very simplified because our layers go way, way, way deeper than this. Right? And this is an example of the kind of graphs that you can create. Right, and I'll show some better examples just in a second. But you can see that's the interface. Hey, give me the links for JSSP 2.5 going upstream and then for X number of layers, right? And that's how it works. So this is an example of, again, the, the graphing and how we actually think about this stuff. I really like this one because this is when you start to see the business narrative, right? And this, this narrative is impossible to do until you can graph it. This is like the 50th version of this. Because what you now have is a feedback loop of somebody making a change in Jira, adding some stuff, creating a graph, seeing what it looks like. And also, we find new sorts of, spot of problems. So if you look at this, what you have is you have a risk story right at the top, which is now affects a particular IT asset who has these facts. So facts is very powerful. So we use, and by the way, each of those is a Jira ticket. Right? Each of those is something that has a documented history that is accepted by somebody. So when we have a fact, that fact will be underwritten by a technology person or a business person or a security person that says, yes, this is true. And that completely changed the dynamic of the whole operation because you become a fact-based environment. And then we have these facts who lead in these vulnerabilities. So you can see the risk story connects with vulnerabilities, which relates to the risk theme. So that is the path to our top level management, who actually then we even map it to the sophistication of exploit, which, <laughs> which is available by these threat actors who can cause these impacts. So you can see that not only we now have the risk part, we also now can plot what is the level of sophistication that we have, and then we can link it to basically the, the threat vectors that they're going to have, and, and basically and the level of sophistication. So this is very powerful. This is how you scale. This is how you, again, make rational decisions. Are we fixing something that actually requires a very high degree of sophistication, or are we fixing something that actually is very easy to exploit, and there's a huge amount of people? And by the way, we also link these two incidents. So here's how we think about projects. Here's a one of our projects. So we use Darktrace, right? We're looking at the things. And now we map the project optimize with some vulnerabilities on it and Symantec, for example. And this is how everything starts to come together, right? Um, so basically, here's another example of this is actually an attack tree. So this means that this attack leads to these attacks who cause this, who cause that, who affects this, who leads to that. And this is going to be addressed by this, by this project who needs that. Right? But this is cool because you can see how I read this in English now. Right? That's why the links matter. 
the, the links matter because I go, this causes that, this causes that, this is affected by this, etc. Right? And even then, you can see problems. Like you see, for example, here, right? This is where the graph visualization is so powerful. That link at the top is not needed, right? Because I can find either ones, right? I can find that guy, I can find this guy from here, right? And I can find that guy from there. So it's very powerful. And what this means is this means that we reduce the number of links in JIRA. So this actually means that we now have a, a, a JIRA environment that you can actually navigate because we clean it up to the graphs. And this is very powerful. It also allows you to remove things from JIRA without freaking out because you understand the side effects. Because in a lot of JIRA environments, everybody after a while is afraid to touch anything. And, ooh, somebody had that link in the past. It must be important, right? So we kind of get eventually very, very brutal. If it doesn't make sense, if it's not connected to something, get rid of it. It's, it's going to show up on somebody's dashboard. If it does, then you deal about it. So this is a good example of how we map roles to people. So what we have here is a bunch of services who basically, the other thing we did, which is very powerful, is each of my functions on, on, the, on the organization, they all map services, right? So the way we've mapped our world, each of the heads define a number of services that they provide. So let's say AppSec, they provide thread modeling services and curve review services and all sorts of stuff. And then from the services, we map that to the projects that we're doing. Right? And then from the projects, we know how, and the service also mapped to the people that need it, and the projects gives us basically what we're doing for the business. So in a way, the projects do what gets funded. So it's quite cool because we can now take a business entity, find the vulnerabilities that it has, and tell them exactly what projects are being done for this. We can also go for every function and says, where are we using this? So basically, this is a representation of, this is exactly the same graph, the same data, just to see it differently. Right? This is using, and a big kudos to Sharif here, because he don't do this tweet, hey, hey, this thing really scales, right? And it's true, VivaGraph is the only one that actually scales, and I'll show you some massive ones, right? All the other ones blow up, you know, very soon. Okay, cool. I like it. We have five, five vendors already on this thing, right? Yeah, let me know. Which is, what's the other one? Oh, Gephi. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll look at it. So, so this is, by the way, this is really cool, right? So the way this is created, and this is the power of Lambda, right? This, each of these takes about five seconds to render, three seconds to render, depends on the size. This is basically a Lambda function that fires up a local web server, that opens up that engine, fires up cr a Chrome serverless, takes a screenshot of the local web server's page, shuts it all down, sends the screenshot down. Really cool. And that happens in about 2.5 seconds if there's nothing happening on the page, between 5 and 15 seconds if it's heavy to render. But that means that we can create a screenshot out of anything that renders in Chrome, which is really cool, right? Because now, you know, as long as you can show in Chrome, we can open up in a Lambda function, we can take a screenshot. And to give you an idea, the team is running this now on, you know, quite regularly. Our costs for Lambda are about $2 per day. In fact, I think we're paying more in CloudTrail logs, right, than we're paying Lambda functions, right, on that thing. But it's crazy powerful, right? So there's, I'm just going to show some interesting examples, right, of how we visualize this. Some of this is funny. Some of this is actual real stuff. But I call this the universe, right, because this is a lot of our tickets. I don't think they're all. I think they're about 50% of the tickets we have. But you can see things, right? You can see projects. You can see vulnerabilities. You can see all sorts of interesting patterns emerging here. You see problems that are not mapped. So it's very, very interesting when you start visualizing. Again, VivaGraph is the only one that is able to do this. And every one of those little dots is a JIRA icon. So that's actually a representation of the data in JIRA. Uh, I call this, this is the work was done yesterday. So this is all the work that the team did in one day. Every one of those is a JIRA ticket. Right? And you can see the instance response kind of at the top. You can see you know, the operational team more here. You can see the people that do more risks of vulnerabilities. What's really cool about this is the interesting, almost like crazy story, which is this guy here, right? which is a member outside group security that opened up a vulnerability. Right? And that's when you celebrate. This is somebody outside our team that is actually now is one of our security champions that on that day actually created a vulnerability, which is great because it means it's starting to work. Right? But it's quite cool. So this is one day. Uh, this is one week. Right? And again, you see a very interesting sense of gravity. 
This is a really cool view of mapping risks and vulnerabilities all together, where you have a program who maps to a bunch of vulnerabilities, who maps to a bunch of risks in red, who then map to the top level risks. And what I, this is actually using VSJS. And what you kind of did is like you, you stretch the top six risks so you get this nice kind of view at the top. Right? But again, this is when we start to experiment stuff, and we find, and even these, you find lots of interesting mappings. This is, a, this is actually our org chart right, of the company, because we actually have recreated the org chart in Jira, so we can find, so we now know that if we find a problem with this thing here, we can go all the way up to management. Right? We call this the bicycle, right? which is kind of an interesting one, but there's a very interesting view of this, because these are actually bad mappings. So what you actually have here is you have the each, each in red is a person. So this is another way of viewing the org chart. And each of those dot, red, blue dots is an IT asset, which is mapped to a person. So the good news is that we've mapped you know, all the you know, particular systems on an area to that person. Kind of the realistic is that person is not responsible right, for 78 systems. Right? But now it's easy to refactor. Because what we need to do is go to that person's kind of line of management and align them. But this is now gives a visual way of what we, know, we want. And, this, and then you start to see what, actually lo what good actually looks like. So it's very interesting, because even from a pattern point of view, you detect things. And, and also, we can measure progress of what we're doing, right? So this is the eye, right? I, I haven't found a great use for this view, but it looks pretty cool, right? This is the circle of view, right? Every one of those is an issue, isn't a thing. I call it the boat or a music equalizer. This was another one. This is actually, I think, Vivograph, but it didn't actually produce anything interesting, right? Um, this, somebody says, it's my brain on Friday, right? <laughs> so it's kind of another view, everything hyperlinked. I like this one, right? It's like, where's everybody? It's like, this is <laughs> it was a mistake, and there just happened to be one dude. Right? Some funny ones that we created. This middle one is a mistake. I called out this. The other one is penguins in Alaska, like sleeping, right? And then the other one was playing with pie charts. We can actually render, uh, um, what's it called, um, calendars, which is great, right? And we can do worldly maps. Does anybody know what a worldly map is? All right. If you, for the ones who don't, you're missing one of the biggest tricks of your career. You have to go and understand it, right? Now, I get. It, it takes a while for you to actually be able to use that stuff, but the way you think about it will never be the same. This was the biggest thing I've learned in the last year, right? And this is absolutely incredible. Now, we're not fully ready to fully apply to this, but this kind of thinking would completely change security once we get data to be able to allow us to create stuff, right? Um, so where it gets interesting, right, is when you start to even take this to another level, and it's not just uh, showing stuff on, on um, G slide, so on Slack. So I remember going to my team and saying, we need to create 50 slide decks, because I want a deck per stakeholder. And I, I almost had a riot on, on my hands, right? Because they're like, there's no way we're going to create that amount of slide decks, blah, 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 right? And I get it, because actually, in my head, I'm going, well, we need to create 500 decks, right? But let, let, me, let me buy one battle at a time, right? And because what you do want to do is automate. So what we've done was we now can create a slide deck directly from Slack, from, from, um, from Slack via right, Google Sheets. Right? So it's very powerful. But Google Sheets has a great API. We already had the Lambda workflow. So let me just walk you through uh, actually some decks that Gemma from my team created, which explains how this works. Right? So you go to a channel. You type GSBot to create the thing. Then you actually add information into Jira here. Then you actually provide your business entity so you can map it like this. And then you actually create the services that you, sorry, the, the projects that you're doing, and you can see how you have a program that is delivered by these projects, right? That's how the whole thing fits in English, right? And then the projects are there, are the ones that appear on the, on the slides, and then you can say, if you add a description here, that's gonna appear here, and basically, we do the same for services, so use some services there. Can you see that you got, um, and basically, a particular project that affects these guys, who delivers this, who reduces the risk of this, and uses particular services. And that's how everything now is, is in English, right? And then you put the services here, and you can see kind of how everything works. Now, the other one is, right, I, I've, I've been for a while, I always been see we have to get rid of spreadsheets, right? Spreadsheets suck, right? They're, they're massive pits. Everybody has these crazy things. They're not updated. They're, they're a disaster, right? And and even when you use the Google Sheets online, it's still you know, an a minor improvement, right? You just create a mess at the high level. But I love them now, right? 
And this was one of those things when I said that, I definitely was called out several times, right? And the reason is because we now sync Google Sheets with Jira. So we actually now use Google Sheets as a way more effective way to enter data into Jira and to sync and consume data from Jira. And this is a, this is a great game changer because Google Sheets gives you crazy features, gives you real-time collaboration, gives you backups, gives you all sorts of visualizations. So, and, and most people already know how to use that stuff, right? So it's really, really powerful. So we now start to use Google Sheets as a synchronization layer between Jira and um, we have data sources. So we use Jira as our master of data. So the source of data is Jira, but now we use Google Sheets almost as a disposable environment to edit, manipulate, and then we forget about it, right? And that is really powerful. So meet Maeve, right? And Maeve is part of our team officially for three months, five months? Oh, Sorry? Nearly three. Three. Nearly. And and she's a great example of a lot of things, right? But the coolest thing is that she came and worked for us in the same challenge, by the same challenge I make you. If you want to work and learn from us, you're more than welcome to come in, spend some time with us, right? Uh, we'll collaborate. We'll give you some stuff to do, right? Um, and then basically you learn a lot while you're there, right? So she did that for a week. She liked it, we liked her, right? We got her a job, she came in, right? And now she's one of the best, uh, I would say, operators of this technology and she's making a huge amount of progress. And, you know, and this is just a, you know, a little bit of her, the Slack channel and she's gonna do a demo and a little introduction. Yep, you can, we'll change it. Good evening. Um, it's lovely to be here tonight. Um, so as Dennis said, I am Maeve Scarry, um, and I joined Photobox nearly three months ago, um, having made a career change from the world of sales. So um, I spent the past few years working for Nestle, the fast-moving consumer goods, um, working with brands such as Kit Kat, Cheerios, um, and Nescafe, alongside retailers such as Asda, Waitrose, and Ocado. However, information security is something that I've always been really passionate um, about and working in the industry. Um, therefore, I did a, a week's work experience with Dennis at Photobox, enjoyed it so much, and was lucky enough to be offered a role, um, and hence why I'm here working at Photobox with uh, the amazing security team. So I'm just going to give a very short presentation um, outlining the steps that are required to sync Google Sheets with uh, Jira. So essentially, being able to edit your data in Jira uh, through Google Sheets. So the first step is to create your ticket in Jira, as I've done here, with a, a meeting uh, issue type. I've then created some tasks, such as create plan, present, sync data, um, and I've entered some information into the la latest information field that exists in Jira. So before I go on to the uh, syncing of the spreadsheets, I just wanted to show you a few ways by which you can visualize the data that you have in Jira. So the first is that using the command that is highlighted in blue uh, using GSBot, you can create a column view, which is very standard but simple. You've got your fields on the left-hand side and any information you might need on the right-hand side. If you want to push the boat out a little bit more, you can visualize your data in a spider view. Um, what's really good is this is a bit more of an abstract way of visualizing the issue types that you have and the links types that you have and a really nice way to view it. And if you want to go even further, uh, we have a command that allows or shows up a menu of the different com uh, graphs that you can use. And the one here, uh, the blue one, is actually a Viva graph, which um, I'm showing you. And if you want to dial it right back to basics um, and show a little bit more detail, you can just use the table view here, which is personally, I like this one a lot. Now, what I really like about being able to view the information um, in different formats is it really allows me to tailor my information depending on my audience. So I have different stakeholders who like to visualize information in different ways. Some of them love the table, some of them love the spider diagrams or the Viva graphs, and it just gives me a lot of choice and variety uh, to really make an impact when I go and speak to the stakeholders. So going back to um, syncing the data with Jira, 
The first step is you have to create a Google Sheet. So again, using this command, it brings up a link, and you can di click directly on the link, and it opens up your Google Sheet, which is here. You can then ed edit your Google Sheet. Uh, so you'll see here that I have just made the titles bold, and I've added in another column, column D, which says latest information, one of the fields in Jira. Um, and then I've added in some text saying, hello, o OWASP. So then the cool bit is I can enter this command, the GSBot Jira Sync, and then the ID uh, of the Google Sheet into GSBot. It comes back with a little message to tell me uh, that the data has uh, been successful in its sync. Um, and you can see here in Jira, it's up there in latest information. So I don't even have to go into Jira or make any changes. I can do it specifically uh, and easily from the sheet. So that's it. Um, it's very easy, very straightforward. It has literally revolutionized my life because I hadn't used Jira before coming to Photobox. Um, yeah, and it's a, great, it's a great tool. So to give you an idea how this is crazy effective, right? <laughs> no, no, stay here, stay here. Oh, okay. so, so we had, for example, a meeting today that literally was a series of sheets for particular projects with stakeholders. And just walk us through how that meeting was. What was the workflow of that meeting? Oh, yeah. Um, so I had to uh, ask a couple of stakeholders um, a, b a long list of questions. So I created the questions in JIRA, downloaded them to a spreadsheet, as I've just shown, um, and I was able to go to the meeting and ask them the questions in real time, editing the answers into the spreadsheet, and then uploading it into JIRA without them ever having to see JIRA. Um, or me ever having to go into Jira, which was really useful. And I had to discuss something like 12 projects with them. And each project had about seven or eight different questions. Um, and we were able to just get it done really quickly in about an hour. And um, I think one of the, the stakeholders in the, uh, the meeting said it was a really good workflow. And it just meant we got loads of information, captured it, um, were able to move on to the next thing quickly. And some of the workflows were, you know, start to be really really powerful. Like, so for example, there was, there was a, a moment on that meeting where she was asking a series of questions, very focused questions. And actually, a number of us that were on the call, we were actually adding more questions. So it was really cool because because think about this, you get this for free from Google Sheets, right? Google Sheets is a distributed multi-user, you know, online in editing environment, so anybody can edit. So it was really powerful in a way to experience the ability to now have, you know, this body of knowledge that which is the experts that are asking the questions, and then have you know Maeve, which is already super knowledgeable, but she has some gaps, but that's fine because the, almost the, the experts on the call can now see the next level of questions. Right? And then what we do is we actually take this, and, and that creates our playbooks. So what we've done, for example, for incidents, is every time there's an incident, we ask for, like, between 10 and 40 questions. Right? And every question is a ticket in JIRA, right? because that's how we scale. But that means we, we go to crazy amount of details, because we can ask those questions and make sure that we capture everything. And, and in a way, I know that it works when when you don't need crazy technical people to actually operate technology and you have workflows like this that really allow things to happen. Can we? Cool. So the final couple of bits here is, is that, um, and, and I kind of want to sort of, oh, sorry. Um, I kind of just want to reiterate one point because the way I look at this, a, a big part of the workflow is about creating systems and solutions that are seamlessless to use, right? And one of the very interesting ones that was very, oops, very seamless to use for us was basically this bit, right? So one of the things that we kind of got for free, this was probably the most powerful feature that GSBot has. So we call it the bot GSBot, which actually took me the least amount of time to implement because I, I did all the plumbing. And then one day it goes, hey, hold on. Google Sheets and G Suite exports to PDF, right? And we can already upload images to Slack. And we already know how to talk to the Google Sheets. So it was like the easiest feature ever. But it gives us this. Right? It gives us the ability to take what Maeve just created, called create PDF for that, and gives you this. It gives the ability to take those slides that are being, and just the thing that we programmatically create those slides based on Jira data, including with graphs, and you can consume that on your phone. 
right? This is, again, this makes a massive difference, right? Because now we can basically consume stuff, right, in your phone, you know, with data that comes from, you know, a, a single source of truth in a very effective way. Right? So basically what we're doing is we are empowering the business to make fact-based security decisions because we connect the dots. But right, you still have to reach the top. Right? You still have to put this in a way that the business understands. Right? And that's the final bit of the puzzle. Because what we now do is we're able to create a risk dashboard that is just made up data here. But this is how we have some errors at the top, and this is how we report to the business. Because we can now say that, hey, on financial 18, we can now give the business a number. In fact, we can give every project, every service, every program, every team a number of how much they're moving the needle. And then we can say we went from there to there, right? And then we can actually show the delta, and we can show where you got worse, where you got better, right? And this is, the, in a way, where, where it gets interesting, because this is now what we're talking to the business, and we say, hey, here is the impact of your decisions. So it's very interesting, because sometimes you have a project that has negative security implications, right? And that's fine. Hopefully, you have another project next to it that has positive, and you have more positives than negatives, right? Or sometimes you have a project that has negative in one side and positive on the other, right? So this allows us to have that level of granularity, right? But this is a language that the business understands, right? Because now you're talking about risk, you talk about deltas, and then what's really cool is they ask you the question, hmm, how did you calculate this, that plus three? And then we go, yeah, like, this is how it is. Oh, how, why do you say we have problems here? Oh, that's how it is. So now we can go down all the way to the crazy facts at the bottom, and we have evidence that links everything. Right? And this is the bit that I find very exciting because I don't think there's that many teams in the world, at least with the size that we have, right, that have been able to connect you know, basically top-level risk-based decisions for management all the way to what's happening on the ground in reality. So that's where I think it's very interesting. And then the final bit is you could also show the delta. So here's the difference between this shows you the overall scores, this shows you what got better and what got worse. So in this one, the grays stay the same, the reds are coming down, the yellows and greens are going up. So this is, in this case, this is the impact of something. You can do this for everything. This could be the impact of buying a company. This could be the impact of doing some, some particular security program. This could be an impact of doing a development. You can use this to measure, basically, your stuff. So final thing, show me the code, right? Most of the code is on GitHub. Uh, there's already broken down in, in, in modules. There's some really cool stuff that we do with code build. So we actually use, again, the AWS stack to build the whole thing. So you, go, you push to GitHub, goes to code build, starts the, this, the, the, the build in seconds, then finishes off all this, the, the tests, and then push it and updates it. So please contribute and participate in the conversation. You know, we are, you know, putting a lot of pieces together, but what we really want is to get others to join in. We, you know, we want to learn from you. We want to kind of uh, see how you operate this stuff. And um, basically, thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. I, I think this was the most mind-blowing uh, presentation I've ever seen. It's, this is what you get when you get gig becoming a CISO and suddenly able to communicate really technical stuff to people who use spreadsheets, yeah. right? And and connect people who use Jira. It's yeah. it's and then people who look at the color charts to measure risks, yeah. right? Okay. Any questions for Dennis? And me. And me. Okay. There's a question here. In, in Jira, the, you know, there's obviously a concept of users baked in. Mm -hmm. but I, I, I sort of implied, though, that you're using a different construct, like using stories or something to represent individuals, or is it actually is it just Jira users? No, no. So we, we actually have a ticket type called people. Yeah, that's right? what I kind that of... That has a ticket yeah. type called role that they're part of. Right. That there's a ticket type called um, IT asset that they, they are a business owner or a, a project manager. So we use the assignee very light. Right, so we kind of use this. So the assignee works well for for a specific almost set of our graph that almost behaves like a Kanban board, right? But the, but again, the Kanban boards, so anybody who uses Jira, tend to be a nightmare, right? We actually found that the metrics and the data that we have within our world is starting, starting to be more effective than even the Jira management bit. 
do you think that through to your corporate directory and uh, to sort of asset inventories and things, or is that all in general? Yeah, anyway? so that's that's the bit that really would love others to help and contribute, right? So we we already have a bunch of programs where we're now taking a lot of data, which is interesting because we're actually using Jira, so we're using Jira Syncs to synchronize that. So we're now taking data feeds from Slack, with data feeds from, from, from Google, we take data feeds from Active Directory, and we're now basically putting that into Sheets, and then we sync that back to Jira. We haven't got fully that yet, and, but that's basically, in fact, we want to get to the point where we, we have our IT assets and we have eventually, I want to have all the applications, I want to have all the methods, and basically, we should be able to go down very granular yeah. because everything should be connected to everything. Fantastic, thank you. I think this mom will push that. The interesting one will be, AWS. I, I want to get AWS keys on it. I actually want to replicate the AWS uh, permissions management, which I don't think nobody understands properly, right? Uh, into Jira. Everybody because we can or anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Denise. Um, had to jump in at everybody. Uh, right. So the last half of your presentation was amazing. The first half I'd seen a little bit of before, um, and I didn't think of this then. So not asking about the last half. Google Sheets integration, excellent, Maeve, awesome. Um, first half. One of your slides had the words risk hyphen 1572 as the uh, n risk you had. Now, I know how long you've been there. Um, how much effort was involved in converting whatever was there before you were there into a taxonomy that was fully laid out in JIRA to the point where you have 1572 risks on a random slide you showed us? Mm -hmm. um, that's question one, but I'll okay. go through. So so I, I actually want to rationalize this. So, so I think there's like um, a five stage of grief, right? When you start to do the graphs in Jira, right? And it's actually, and it, it kind of goes like, you know, oh, this is crazy. You know, the data is too much. Then I can't find anything. Then it's about, you know, the kind of evolution of, you know, the scheme is wrong. And then the, the, they get it. And then they add even more stuff to it, right? And eventually it clicks, right? And uh, the, so the key kind of challenge is, by, is that you don't control the quality of the data going in, right? That is the single biggest mistake I think everybody does. Because what that does is, is that creates almost like a top-down control, and you prevent the innovation and the fast iteration to occur. So what you do is you control the quality of the data by the relationships and the visualizations, right? And, that, and the peer reviews. So the reality is that... You know, and I actually remember when I started doing this, my, my joke was the game hasn't started until we hit, we, we hit risk 500, right? And by the way, everybody has this, right? You all have spreadsheets with hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of stuff, right? So the problem that you always have is not the data, right? You, everybody has a lot of data. The problem is the data is not hyperlinked, it's not assigned, it's not normalized, and it took us a lot of generations to find the language. And we haven't got it right yet. Right? And it's actually, I think the biggest challenge is there is this myth that everybody wants the schema, right? So we actually had this very funny situation where a member of my team would look at this and he's like very rational. So you come in in one week and say, okay, I get it. This is what you guys try to do, right? So you come back two weeks later going, here's my proposal. Here's how I think we now should work. And by then we've moved, right? And we not move a little bit. We like, we added five issue types, four issue links, and a whole bunch of stuff. And go, oh yeah, by the way, we introduced facts. Did we forget about that one? Yeah, so that changes everything. And then the guy comes back two weeks later and we change everything again, right? And, and, and the reason we change is because we hitting reality, right? And when you hit reality, instead of shoehorning some concept, we create more. So it's almost like you create this organic flow of change. And the way you get to very effective and efficient schemas is not by forcing, is by creating this environment that rewards a particular behavior, and then it becomes good, not because I said it, not because I come along and says, here's a schema, I end the ride and nobody freaking changes it, it's because it works. And nobody can come up with a better idea why when you have a risk, it has a vulnerability, right? And the vulnerability is created by a risk, right? And the project is delivered by a key result. And the key result, right, delivers, delivered by this task. So eventually you have a language, right? And this is kind of, again, what Simon Worley talks about, is having a common language is the hardest part. So I think that one of the biggest assets that we have now is not a tech, right, which is a cool, which enables things, is actually the understanding and the language that we start to create that makes sense in our company. And this is what you guys all have to do. You have to find how does your company want to communicate, and you reverse engineer that in your graph. 
And it gets even more interesting because it's not just how your company is, it's almost how that individual or that team. The power of a graph is allows you, instead of arguing, what should I call this, allows to say, how do you think about this? Let me reverse engineer my stuff to how you think and how you understand. So how many generations did it take until it was understandable by your less jira inclined business units? I think we stopped counting now. Oh, I mean, I, I'm because now it's, you we, got we're there, changing I mean, all the time. Now it? change has become part of, well, you know, still some bits, but I believe now change is now part of what we do. Like maybe it's a good example, right? So when we did a project in the beginning, she was freaking out. There was too many uh, tasks and stuff like that. Now she's creating a project left, right and center, which is for me the right level granularity. Now she goes, oh, that's really powerful. I'm going to create a project for that. I'm going to link to that program and we're going to prioritize based on this other stuff that we do. And by the way, can you tell me the tasks for that project so we know that you have thought about it, right? So I always find that if somebody is worried about creating too many tickets, they haven't reached the right level of maturity because you want to go to the level of granularity that it makes sense for the task that you want to do. And the graphs allows you to do that. And by the way, this is a problem that every software development team that I know have because they like to create epics too big, but you need the granularity, right? So I had two questions on graph and graph algorithms. Yep. So I think you moved from Neo4j yep. and eventually ended up in Elk. Mm -hmm. um, how have you found it? And also, um, have you looked at Neptune or something else mm -hmm. that is um, both, both an RDF and um, a property graph? Yeah, yeah. So I actually wrote, uh, somebody asked me that question, right, a couple of days ago. And I was a bit cheeky because I got the answer and I put it on Twitter. So I got a bit of hit for it. But um, let, me ask the f let me answer the first one, right? So the reason. Right? And by the way, Neo4j is a great thing. Right? We actually did some really cool stuff. Actually, I can open right here. So um, Neo4j is great, but Neo4j has you know, a number of gaps that we're going to. But the, before that, we have today our scalability problem is not Jira. Right? In fact, uh, we could create all this with anything that does triplets. So I actually think that once we move to mass amount of data, we move to something like Neptune or something that can do triplets, you know, two, you know, two the subject predicates and, um, and the other one. Right? which is basically from link type 2. So Neptune will give you that. Our problem today is not the scalability of the size of the data that we have in the queries, because we actually pump it all to Elasticsearch, which is great, because Elasticsearch handles millions and billions of records, and we only have like you know, 30,000, right? So everything in Elasticsearch is close to real time. But the, the, the problem is the language, right? And, and there's, there's one myth I want to make sure I, I can't dispel. The, the point of this, right, this, this system or this concept is designed to start from scratch because this is what we do every time we hit a new application or a new system or a new division, right, or the company acquires a new co another company, right? The point here is to capture all your knowledge, right? So you can do this from scratch because you just need to talk to somebody and instead of your information ending up on your notebook, right, or your spreadsheet, it ends up in something like a Jira workflow. That, that gets me to my next question, which is actually the algorithms. So what do you use the graph for outside of visualization? Do you use any of the graph-specific algorithms like page rank or shortest path or that type yep. of thing? So um, and actually, let me then answer the first question with the Neo4j. So most of the, most of the graphs, algorithms that we use are actually written in Python. And the reason we do it in Python is because we create all sorts of level of abstractions that allows us to then ask questions, here's a risk, here's an issue, can you follow this here, can you follow that up? But there's been some cases where I actually use network X, right, in, uh, which is one of the graph al algorithm things. And, and that, for them, there was a case where we needed to calculate all the paths between A and B. But it's quite interesting, right? And this is the biggest problem I found with graph databases. So you don't put the data in the database and then clean it up, right? It's the same thing like cows versus puppies, right? Your graph database, sorry, your, the, where you visualize your data is, should be a cow or a chicken, right? It should be disposable, right? And it should not be a pet. The biggest problem I have with Neo4j is I was creating a pet, right? So Neo4j, it basically uh, allows transformation to modify the raw data. Right? It doesn't scale the visualizations. The Cypher query is freaking complex, right? Like you try to make sense of that thing, it's crazy complex, right? I can write, you know, much more simple queries that do the same thing using Python methods that chain that. So the reality is cheaper 
to create abstraction layers in Python that then run on AWS serverless environments that gives you really, really focused specific business questions uh, in, um, kind of queries than I found with any graph database. And, and this is very powerful because it allows me. So the way I look at it is that you know, I don't need to be coding this, right? What I need to do is have enough coding technology to be able to express my questions in APIs. And now I'm privileged that I get to consume really rich APIs that got created that express that level of, um, of thinking. So I, I, I should say, I, I'm still yet to find a use case that is not faster, simpler, more efficient, and more scalable to solve in Python, right? Or with simple, like, you know, lists of, um, of nodes and paths, which thing like Network X gives you already. Yeah, no, I was interested in the Network X algorithms that yeah. you use because they're almost, I wouldn't say universal, but yeah, yeah. you use yeah. the di different algorithms. It's just you're using it on a different uh, technology. So I would actually say that the way we create those graphs, and, and this is that like you have to almost experience it. So there was lots of times in the team where I saw this happening. I saw somebody go to Jira, make some changes, go and create the graph, look at what it looked like, go to Jira, make some changes. And actually, that's the algorithm, right? In a way, is if you can visualize your changes very quickly, and that happens within five or 10 seconds, that becomes your algorithm. Like, and sometimes you have to cheat, right? The problem with graphs, the more hyperlinked they get, it's very easy to always get the freaking blob, right? Because everything is connected to everything. And if you make it too complex, and, and sometimes you have to actually add nodes that don't exist in reality, which is another problem I had with Neo4j, that every time I did that, the freaking database started to go all over the place, right? And you didn't have source of truth. And in Neo4j, you can edit the data very easily, right? Um, it, for me, it's like, I think that you have a source of truth, which could be Neptune one day. I don't have a problem with that, right? But, then, but that's the source of truth I used to edit. And then you export it to all these different visualization bits. So. Cool. OK. Um, uh, thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, right. I think uh, it's time for us to finish this meetup. So uh, I'd like to say big thank you.